Uh, dear friends, I'm Homi Baba, and I'm greatly privileged to introduce to you this evening our speaker, Patrick Kingsley, and our discussants, Tobias Garnett and Parul Segal. Patrick Kingsley is an international correspondent for the New York Times, based in Berlin. He previously covered migration and the Middle East for The Guardian, <clears throat> and is the author of two books, How to Be Danish, An Exploration of Contemporary Danish Culture, and the remarkable work that I know better, The New Odyssey, A Portrait of the European Refugee Crisis. <clears throat> Tobias Garnett is a human rights lawyer. Um, he moved to Istanbul in 2015 to work on the refugee crisis before representing, uh, uh, before representing Turkish journalists imprisoned following the 2016 failed coup, for which he was named the youngest ever human rights lawyer of the year by the UK Law Society. So now the challenge is on, if anybody in the audience would now like to be the even younger recipient of this award, please uh, rush. Uh, he's currently a Glitzman Social Activism Fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Parul Segal is a book critic at the New York Times. She was previously a senior editor and columnist at the New York Times Book Review, where she wrote extensively about language, literature and translation, race, memory, trauma, and identity. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, Slate, Book Forum, The New Yorker, and The Literary Review, amongst other publications. And she was awarded the Nona Belekian Award for the National Book Critics Circle for her criticism. It is indeed a privilege to host three speakers who so courageously and clearly address issues at the very core of the Mahindra Center seminar on migration and the humanities. But this privilege is shadowed by pain. For at the very core of our topic beats the heart of darkness, and Patrick, Tobias, and Parul in different ways have kept a steadfast finger on the pulse of the precarious and desperate conditions of migrants in distress, refugees on the march, and the stateless in limbo, together amounting to a global population of over 67 million people who represent a country larger than the United Kingdom, although they are, of course, a people without a nation. Our seminar, Migration in the Humanities, has been exemplary in exploring how migration as text, topic, trope, and fact requires a pedagogy that moves across the intersection of disciplines and demands a political understanding of human rights, legal regulations, ethical choices, and psychic affects engage with people on the move. I want to thank Andrea Volpe for her excellent curation of tonight's events, as well as other programs in connection with this seminar. The right to movement, a central tenet of the University of, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and this is, of course, not the only moment in the history of refugees, because there is also the moment of settlement, there is the moment of, uh, of, of not being appropriated and yet being integrated. There are all these several moments of stasis and movement. And I want to make that clear that I believe that movement is not a, simply a smooth form of movement or even a jagged form of movement. It's always a kind of stop and start. It's a, it's a kind of fibrillation of a historical experience. The right to movement, a central tenet of the Universal Declaration, has cultural and humanistic implications beyond or beside the legal construal of rights. Poor and stricken populations on the move in fear and flight activate the anxieties and antagonisms of the privileged and powerful whose sense of security and sociality 
is based on territorial stability and the dreams of sovereign citizenship. It is as if the nation-centered imagined community cannot allow itself to think and feel beyond national borders that are in many cases, as we know, politically expedient constructions steeped in colonial violence and imperial usurpation. <clears throat> as people on the move enter the domains of political expulsion and legal exclusion, they also enter the discursive and tropic domains of cultural misrepresentation and political misrecognition. In the jaundiced eyes of the White House and white supremacists or populists <laughs> the world over, once Mexicans arrive at the US borders, they are nothing more than criminals and rapists. And Honduran asylum seekers in fear of their lives are arbitrarily accused of harboring in their midst terrorists. This reminds me of a line from Hannah Arendt's very early essay, We Refugees, where she observes that our enemies put us in concentration camps and our friends put us in detention camps. Our invitation to Patrick Kingsley originated in my rapt reading of his stunning book, The New Odyssey. As a witness to the refugee crisis in Europe, as a day-by-day -day participant in the perilous migrant search for security and citizenship, as a friend to those whose lives he observes and whose stories he tells, Patrick has no equal. In a narrative, that is as subtle as it is straightforward, Patrick narrates the aspirations and the agonies, the danger and the daring of the life worlds of migration. The dire necessity to move, to flee, to settle, to enter the great labyrinth of forms of deceit and invisibility in order to live or to take flight is reason enough for recognizing the rights of migration. To create a status hierarchy amongst migrants, economic and political, might be expedient, even necessary at times, but such distinctions have often little moral merit. Patrick's narrative redraws the map of Europe from the perspective of migrations, territorial sovereignty is diminished, in the face of human necessity. Welcome, Patrick. I have known, relax, Patrick, your moment will come. I have known Tobias Garnett in a seminar where his fine legal mind and forensic talent kept humanists like me in check. Outside the seminar, I've greatly enjoyed Tobias's company and conversation on a range of social and cultural issues. My enduring admiration and respect for him is grounded in his remarkable engagement with Syrian refugees in Istanbul and his political and legal advocacy. We are indebted to Parul Segal's art of critical judgment and observation. Parul has altered the cultural vision, in my view, of the New York Times to delve deeply and range widely in the writings of migrants, the displaced, and the diasporic. We are in her debt for ever so subtly shifting the emphasis from the talented individual writer who emerged from such a historical provenance to a more concerted attention to the collective power of the oeuvre of such writers who now provide a new, distinctive, at sometimes agonizing, at other times ecstatic framework for engaging with what we experience as 20th century contemporaneity. Welcome, Peru. So welcome to all three of you. Patrick will now speak. And after he does that, we'll have a panel of discussants. And then we'll open out to the audience. Thank you for being here today.
thank you very much, Homi, for such an um, undeservedly generous introduction. Uh, and to Andrea for uh, organizing the logistics of uh, our travel here. And uh, to Tobias and Peru for uh, joining this discussion. And of course, to you all for coming. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, I'm going to be talking today, as it says on the poster, about the 2015 migration crisis in Europe and my experiences reporting on it. And I want to use that crisis as a springboard for discussing the ethical and linguistic challenges um, of reporting on migration in general. And in the process, I'm going to try to pose um, four questions, roughly in sequence. To what extent can one report objectively about migration? Can one report about migration without objectifying one's subjects? Is it possible to use a neutral vocabulary when describing migration? And finally, to what extent should migration reporters attempt to encourage empathy in their readers? And to what extent would that even be possible? And I wanted to, to start this discussion by remembering a fairly minor moment towards the beginning of the 2015 crisis, before anyone had really noticed it was happening. It was around 1.30 in the early hours of April the 28th, 2015, and a Syrian civil servant called Hashem Asuki was limping across the main hall at Copenhagen Central Station, trying to find the money for the last stage of his journey to safety. It was three years since Hashim was jailed, tortured, and electrocuted in Damascus. It was two years since he'd managed to flee Syria with his family for Egypt. It was six months since they had all nearly drowned trying to cross the Mediterranean, two weeks since he had tried the crossing again, alone, and six days since he had arrived safely in Italy. And since then, Hashim had evaded the police on the French border, made his way through France, Germany, and half of Denmark. Now he was within just a half hour train ride to Sweden, where the government had promised asylum to any Syrians who crossed the Swedish borders. And it was in Sweden where Hashim hoped he and his wife and their three sons could spend the rest of their lives. But first, he needed to buy a ticket, and to do so before the random border checks began again in the morning. And that was proving difficult. At the first ticket booth, he needed a credit card. And like most refugees, he didn't have one. The second booth, which took cash, revealed a bigger problem. He was now outside the Eurozone, so the Euros that he had picked up in Italy were no longer of any use. And at 1.30 in the morning, there weren't any money exchanges open that could swap his Euros for Danish krona. So, Hashim limped around the red-bricked concourse of the station, trying to find any shop that would let him pay for something in euros and then give him change in krona. McDonald's was the only option. But even as he entered it, another customer was already being told that no, McDonald's will not accept euros. And there was no other shop open in the station. It was a painful moment Hashim was exhausted, physically, mentally, and emotionally. The past three years had been defined by constant trauma and frequent humiliation. The past two weeks had seen him risk arrest, death, and starvation to cross a sea and a continent. He was thirsty, hungry, smelly, and sleep-deprived. His face was strained with worry. Every step he walked, he felt a pang in his infected foot. His knees wobbled in the cold. He had come so close to safety and yet remained so far from it. 
And if I had wanted to, I could have ended his problems within seconds. Because I was there. I'd got to know Hashem in Egypt, and I had accompanied him since his arrival in Italy two weeks earlier. I was with him on the French, German and Danish borders, and I was with him during these moments at Copenhagen Central Station. If I had wanted to, I could have taken my debit card from my wallet and paid for his ticket. He could have been on the train within minutes and in Sweden within half an hour. But I wasn't sure I should. As a human being, I felt the moral thing was to buy the ticket. But as a reporter, the ethical choice wasn't so obvious. And in moments like this, it's not clear whether a reporter is allowed to be a human. The point of accompanying Hashim on this journey was to write about it. And the point of writing about it was to humanize a situation that might otherwise seem alienating to residents of Europe. We were in the middle of a historic migration of people, a phenomenon that some European journalists and politicians had presented as an invasion. By focusing just on Hashim's individual life, and in particular on his individual journey, I was trying to help shift the conversation away from the anonymizing and alienating discourses of a foreign swarm, to use the language of the then British Prime Minister. I wanted to convey the idea that every boatload arriving on the shores of the northern Mediterranean was full of individuals with their own personalities and flaws and dreams and histories. The human in me felt it would be very much in keeping with that journalistic mission to just pay for Hashem's ticket. If the point of my journalism was to foster compassion in others, I wondered if I should just shortcut, short circuit the compassion loop just this once and provide an immediate version of the support and kindness that I hoped my subsequent article might eventually engender in others. But the journalist in me worked with a different an almost paradoxical logic. A central goal of journalism is often a humane one, to provide accurate information and thereby improve public understanding, and perhaps in the process to change the way that people react to a certain subject, which in this case was migration. But that humane goal is only considered achievable, at least in traditional journalistic circles, if journalists are trusted to be objective, dispassionate, and even cold vessels for that information. In other words, if journalists serve as witnesses rather than participants. If I intervened in Hashem's journey that cold night in Copenhagen, I felt I would be doing right as a human, but I would have been blurring the boundary between participant and witness. And with that, I wondered that night have been the right thing to do as a journalist. These are the kinds of questions and dilemmas that I found myself facing throughout 2015 and 2016, when more than a million people landed in irregular fashion on the shores of Europe. Today, I work for the New York Times, but back then I worked for The Guardian, as the paper's first migration correspondent. It was my job to cover the European migration crisis, a role that took me to 17 countries along the migration trail, from as far south as Niger and Libya to as far north as Sweden, from the shores of Turkey to the mountains of the Balkans via several trips to the Mediterranean. To an extent, the ethical and practical and linguistic and emotional challenges that just this job provided were not particularly different to those I've encountered in other journalistic arenas, or perhaps to those tackled by Harvard academics throughout your own research. The relationship between a researcher and his or her source is often a vexed one, whatever one's beat. The act of mining a source for details about their lives, then presenting those details to a foreign public, packaging them in a fashion over which the source 
has no control. And finally, framing them in a context that is more recognizable to a foreign audience than to your subject. All this often runs the risk of exploitation, whether you're writing about migration or not. And when a foreigner, particularly a white male foreigner, simplifies things for an international audience, that reporting will often by default objectify its subjects, again, whether you're writing about migration or not. The gap in privilege and opportunity between a reporter and their source, and the power to intervene both positively and negatively in a source's life, is one experienced by journalists in many kinds of situations. But while, re while reporting on migration, I did feel I encountered these quandaries and imbalances more often than usual, and that these dynamics were both more complex and more consequential. This was partly because the structural imbalance between me and my sources was that much greater. When reporting on the aftermath of the Egyptian uprising two years earlier, for example, my passport offered me considerable protection on the occasions when I was detained by the police. And that was a privilege unavailable to any Egyptian. However, when I was in the streets with protesters, we at least occasionally faced similar dangers, bullets, tear gas, and petrol bombs. Two years later, however, reporting on Europe's migration crisis, there was no similar leveler. You were either allowed to reach Europe and to travel through it, or you weren't. To get from Turkey to Greece, I could have taken a ferry and then watched hundreds of Syrians, Iraqis, and Afghans risk their lives to make the same journey in deflating rubber dinghies. When walking over the Hungarian border with a group of Syrians, I wasn't doing anything that would get me into trouble. But if those Syrians were caught by border guards, they might be beaten, deported, or forced to apply for asylum in Hungary instead of, for example, Sweden. When Hashem, the man I mentioned earlier, went a second time by boat to Europe, I considered going with him on the boat. I even bought a wetsuit and spoke to smugglers about joining his ship. But in the end, I didn't go. I just flew directly to Italy. The sea was a danger that, unlike Hashem, I didn't have to risk. And so, in the time that it took him to cross one border illegally, I was allowed to legally cross seven borders, moving, for various reasons, from Egypt to Turkey to Jordan, through government-held Libya, rebel-held Libya, Tunisia, Malta, before finally joining Hashem in Milan. The social impact, meanwhile, that one might have while reporting on this particular crisis was also, at least in theory, much greater than anything one might achieve in many other forms of foreign correspondence. As an international news reporter, you are generally reporting on events that unravel far from the lived experiences of the majority of your readers or viewers. That process has its own profound problems, some of which I mentioned earlier, and its own capacity to cause harm. But it really directly affects how your readers behave personally towards the subjects of your journalism, essentially because your readers and your sources will almost never meet. There is a feedback loop between your reporting and the biases and even political decisions to which your reporting can contribute, but it is usually a fairly long feedback loop. Covering the 2015 crisis, however, was different. It was a story that began in Syria in Turkey and in Libya, but which ended all across Europe. The subjects of my reporting were often either already in Europe or at least trying to get there. And their arrival would have, and continues to have, political, cultural, social, and economic ramifications for years to come. And for a reporter, that created several challenges. As a journalist specializing on the subject, I felt a responsibility to dispel myths about migration, 
But I also had to avoid the resulting temptation to dispel those myths with ideological frameworks of my own. When it was alleged that a perpetrator of the Paris attacks in November 2015 had possibly entered Europe on a refugee boat, I had to balance an initial impulse to scoff at that claim, given that it sounded so similar to far-right propaganda, with the acknowledgement that such a claim was entirely plausible and indeed turned out to be true. I also needed to recognize that the structural problems incumbent within foreign correspondency had not simply disappeared because I was reporting closer to home. My journalism could still endanger the people I was writing about, even though they had now reached Europe. They had families that had le they had left behind in war zones or in dictatorships, and asylums, asylum applications that they had still to make, all of which might be prejudiced by things that they said to me and which I subsequently published. And every time I wrote an article, I was still exploiting and harnessing someone else's experiences and stories, even if my intention was to frame them in an empathetic light to my readers. In the process, my work still ran the risk of Orientalism and objectification, even though it was being produced from inside Europe. Even the attempt to humanize a man like Hashim and to present him as an individual rather than a caricature instead ran the risk of doing the opposite, of treating him like a cipher, a symbol, or a parable. Explaining the geography of migration in a way that made sense to European readers also risked mis misrepresenting how a migrant had actually experienced their journey. To the un uninitiated migrant, Europe could be a confusing blur. It was filled with places and even countries they often hadn't heard of, and borders they sometimes couldn't see. They navigated it not with a rough guide or trip advisor, but with scraps of advice and hearsay gleaned from Facebook groups and WhatsApp during fleeting connections to Wi-Fi. In the process, their journey constituted a reimagining of Europe's geographic space, one where the continent was no longer conceptualized as a neat map of 50 individual countries with separate jurisdictions, but a continuous tunnel of largely indistinguishable Balkan states that surfaced eventually in Germany or Scandinavia. Yet when framing these journeys for a reader, I tended to describe them in the textual equivalent of a neat map, a bird's eye view journey from A to B to C, rather than as the messy and reimagined space that a migrant might have experienced. Even basic linguistic choices oriented towards my readers could misrepresent migrants themselves or pooled their experiences in ways that ran counter to my aims. In a review of my book about the refugee crisis for the magazine Book Forum, Atusa Abrahamian noted that he, i.e. me, doesn't quite shake the deadline-driven urgency of the Daily News reporter occasionally succumbing to tired cliches. The lexicon of the refugee crisis is full of imprecise, watery metaphors, waves, wakes, flows, floods, influxes, floodgates, tides. This sort of language, even when employed inadvertently, has a dehumanizing effect. And Atusa was, of course, right. If you describe migration, as I often did, in terms of flows and floods, you implicitly obscure the individual circumstances of individual migrants. It also isn't even a particularly accurate metaphor. The word flow suggests a long and continuous movement from origin to destination, from Syria, for example, to Sweden, or from the Ivory Coast to France. But in reality, many of the people who arrived in Europe in 2015 had moved, as Homi said in his introduction, in fits and starts 
and often had never intended to make for Europe when they first left home. Syrians often tried to find safety within calmer parts of Syria. If that failed, they settled in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, or in Hashem's case, Egypt. It was only two or three years later that so many people then tried to get to Europe. Similarly, some of the Afghans who arrived in 2015 had in fact spent years in Iran. And a significant proportion of the West African migrants who arrived in Italy from Libya had initially intended for Libya itself to be their final destination. The word flow, meanwhile, implies that migration to Europe was inevitable, whereas in reality it happened in stages and involved as much stasis as movement. And by presenting the 2015 crisis as something inevitable, Flo also perhaps implicitly absolved the West, not only of its role in the conflicts that caused so much initial displacement, but also of exacerbating the dynamics that encouraged many of the displaced to subsequently make for Europe. It ignored how the European and North American failure to create a viable resettlement program for refugees who'd fled to Turkey or Lebanon had in turn contributed to their increased desire to reach the West by more irregular means. The word flood was also inaccurate because it presented the crisis and unmanageable. As is often noted, if a country like Lebanon, with a country with a population of um, between four and five million, can take in two million refugees, then the European Union, with a population of 500 million, should have easily been able to welcome the comparatively small number that arrived in Europe in 2015. Yet the overuse of a word like flood, and even the word crisis itself, subtly contributed to the sense of a con continent being overwhelmed. These were ideas that I did write about at the time, but to some extent I undermine my own analysis with my choice of language and my failure to find alternative vocabularies. And this wasn't the only linguistic decision that I struggled with. When I began reporting on migration, I figured it was best to describe people on the move as migrants. It seemed like a perfectly neutral word. But as 2015 developed, migrant, like other initially neutral descriptors before it, such as asylum seeker and immigrant, was increasingly used by news outlets in a more negative sense. In certain quarters, migrant came implicitly to mean someone undeserving of empathy, someone traveling for economic reasons rather than for as yet undetermined ones, let alone for reasons of safety. In response, there was a drive by the UN Refugee Agency and by news groups such as Al Jazeera and The Guardian to use less pejorative language to describe people on the move. As an alternative default, they suggested the word refugee, an epithet that even today still just about means something positive. For advocates like the UN Refugee Agency, this made a lot of sense. The crisis was overwhelmingly propelled by people who would qualify for protection under the 1951 Refugee Convention. In the short term, it therefore made sense to use language that highlighted their right to protection, since it might remind politicians of their duty to provide it. But for journalists, I felt the use of refugee as a default was problematic, even if I sympathized with the intention. By describing people as refugees, you suggest that you already know both why they began their journey and the outcome of their asylum application at the end of it. But when you're describing a large group of people whom you don't know, it makes sense to define them by what they're doing, which is something you can be reasonably sure of, rather than why they're doing it, which you can't. The word migrant is the most efficient way of achieving this. In the purest sense, it simply means someone on the move, and it casts no aspersions, positive or negative, 
about why they set out in the first place. And by using migrant as a default, you also resist defining migrants in opposition to refugees. Whereas by describing people as refugees in a bid to increase public sympathy for them, you implicitly accept that a migrant is someone undeserving of the same sympathy. That refugees had good reason to leave home, whereas migrants did not. But for me, this is a problematic differentiation. In reality, all refugees are by definition also migrants. And in an era in which migration will be increasingly driven by climate change, it is unhelpful to imply that those migrants who are not refugees, i.e. who are broadly not at risk of persecution or violence in their countries of origin, do not also have legitimate reasons to migrate. Reporting on the 2015 crisis was therefore not just a battle between advocacy and documentation, or between witnessing something and participating in it. It was also a battle between different kinds of advocacy and different kinds of documentation. The choice of the word migrant over the word refugee was not simply a choice between neutral documentation and partisan advocacy. It was also itself an implicit form of advocacy in the way that it essentially advocated for migrants as well as a narrower group of refugees. There was a comparable tension between two of the main ways in which I attempted to frame the crisis. The first was to zoom in on particular flashpoints in Europe, on the Greek islands, for instance, or on the Hungarian border, or at the camps at Calais. The second was to zoom out, to show that Europe was just one small part of wider migratory patterns and to highlight the much larger mass movements of people to places like Turkey, Libya, and Jordan. They were both reflections of reality, and yet they both, to some extent, contradicted each other. The latter downplayed Europe's problems as a minor subset of a larger issue. The former, conversely, created a sense of urgency about what was specifically going on in Europe. In one sense, this was a tension between two different forms of documentation that has always been present in journalism. The news industry's reflex is to highlight the exceptional quality of an event, yet good journalism often involves highlighting its unexceptional quality. It's hard to do both of these things at the same time, and yet, if you don't marry the two, you end up oscillating between two different and problematic forms of advocacy. By focusing on the chaos at a particular beach or train station in a well-meant attempt to speed awareness of a tragedy unraveling within Europe's borders, one instead risked unintentionally mimicking the xenophobic argument that this migration amounted to a violent and unmanageable invasion. By contrast, if you zoom out too far in an effort to highlight the eminently manageable nature of the situation, you risk diverting humanitarian aid and public outcry away from a, an event that nevertheless still required urgent political and humanitarian attention. My mandate as a migration correspondent, rather than say an immigration correspondent or an integration correspondent, risked also fetishizing the drama of the journeys migrants were making at the expense of asking harder questions and undertaking less glamorous reporting about the logistics of how so many people would be received and welcomed at their final destinations. Later in the crisis, after the European Union agreed a deal to deport asylum seekers in Greece back to Turkey, I spent time reporting how Turkey was not a safe place for migrants to return to. But privately, I occasionally wondered whether this line of reporting did more harm than good. I wondered whether returning to Turkey was really any worse than being marooned in a squalid refugee camp in Greece. And whether, by scrutinizing EU policies like this, 
a reporter might be in fact undermining Europe's best chance of managing an impossible situation and also making it harder for moderate European leaders to demonstrate to anxious voters that they had regained control of European borders. Later still, I feared that my work went too far the other way. After far-right leaders did indeed claim that Europe's centrist leadership had failed to solve the crisis, I reported on how migration numbers had in fact returned to their pre-2015 levels, and that this drop was largely thanks to the work of centrists like Angela Merkel, rather than far-right populists such as Matteo Salvini. And in the process, I wondered if the framing of this reporting implicitly validated policies that had left thousands of migrants trapped in slavery-like conditions in Libya. On a separate note, I even questioned the logic of attempting to humanize migration in the first place. I wondered if by trying to encourage empathy in readers, one instead ended up exhausting what remaining reserves of empathy that people still had. Reading the comments under some of my articles about shipwrecks or about individual people like Hashem, I would often find deeply unsympathetic responses from readers who thought these migrants should have been left to drown at sea. That led me to question whether the simple documentation of a tragedy is enough to induce long-term empathy in one's audience, or whether one needs to provide an audience with a means of channeling that empathy in order to ensure that it doesn't ebb into indifference. The horror a reader derives from reading about tragedy can quickly morph into a sense of powerlessness if they, as an ordinary citizen, cannot see a means in which they can personally help to ease that horror. And as newspapers, websites, and news feeds became saturated with documentations of hardship in 2015, I suspect that for many readers, this combination of horror on the one hand and powerlessness on the other became an increasingly exhausting set of emotions to contend with. So I wonder if instead of weathering that low-level emotional trauma, article after article, TV report after TV report, it eventually became more practical for some readers to convince themselves that the subjects of all this reportage were simply not worthy of empathy. If you don't empathize with something, you consequently feel no obligation to do anything about it, and you thereby free yourself of the emotional burden you might otherwise take on by reading about and empathizing with someone like Hashim. Are people instinctively cruel? Personally, I don't think so. But I wonder if when it becomes exhausting to constantly feel empathy for a situation beyond your control, cruelty nevertheless becomes an excellent defense mechanism. And in that context, I've sometimes wondered if an excess of reportage can destroy empathy as much as encourage it. I began this talk by suggesting that reporting on the migration crisis in Europe was a wrestle between observation and participation. I want to end it by suggesting that in fact, one way or another, as Homi mentioned in the in introduction, it was in fact almost impossible to avoid participating. That night in Copenhagen Central Station, I didn't end up paying for Hashem's ticket. We stumbled about in the cold until he found a news agent that was still open. He paid for some chewing gum with a 20 euro note and got the change in Danish krona. He used that change to buy a ticket and an hour later he was in Sweden. In the past, I've often cited this scene as an example of how I was able to remain a witness instead of a participant in Hashem's journey. And perhaps literally that is true. But as time has gone on, I've also come to recognize that I was indirectly participating all along. 
even if I chose not to directly participate in specific moments such as this one. Thank you for listening. Patrick, thank you for a really exquisite yet incisive uh, speech which allowed you to interrogate yourself and your own practices with great integrity and for those of us who read you or read other newspapers you know, and, and, re and are interested in these issues, um, it gave me a sense of what the work of journalism is, whatever in a way its object happens to be, in this case, of course, migration, which has a very particular charge. So as you said, you started very beautifully looking at the question of participation and witnessing. Either you participate or you witness and you want to maintain that tension. Uh, it's very human, human and humane tension. And then we had this remarkable uh, journey through the effects of language on policy and how the journalist tries to balance these things. And then eventually the question of empathy and how much empathy can we show and how often can we show it and is there empathy exhaustion? Uh, and it struck me that maybe the better thing is just to say whatever my empathetic um, uh, affect is or isn't, I'm, I'm going to think of the law, I'm going to think of the rights, I'm going to think of the moral issue. You know, whether I'm, a, I know that refugees should be protected. That I'm going to hold on to the principle rather than the affect. I'm not saying this is possible, I'm just saying this is a way of dealing with empathy exhaustion. This is why many of the people who you agree with politically are the last people you want to necessarily have a cup of tea with or just have a chat with quite often because they're not empathetic people and yet they're very principled. Do you see what I'm, the distinction I'm making? So with all that in mind, I want to turn to you, Peru, hmm. because this is such a writerly talk hmm. while being at the same time politically urgent. And you have worked consistently on fictions hmm. that are Based on this, on this, on this narrow edge yeah. between both participating right. and critiquing or witnessing, yeah. and so I just wanted your re response to um, Patrick. You, can you hear me? Or do I need to use this? I can use this. Um, no, I'm, I'm. Well, sorry, not too much of this, but <laughs> judicious amounts of this. Um, no, I was very grateful for your your talk, and I and I love your book because I think one of the things that you do in your book is you're constantly interrogating language. And I think if there's anything that connects what the four of us do um, and our relationship with this issue is that we're all wary of the language. We're all a little skeptical of the language. The language feels suspect. The language feels contaminated in ways. Um, and when in your book, you, know, you sort of draw the, the difference between migrant versus refugee. I mean, even the term, I find myself very reluctant to use the word the migrant these days also in a way that I never did five years ago. It feels so bizarre to, to talk about an individual identity based on an action. What else, who else do we do this to? Um, and I think in the last, I mean, to your question, Homi, I mean, like all of the sort of um, things you were just talking about right now and that sort of animate your book have been a really uh, exciting development in fiction in the last couple of years. And it feels like it's getting more sophisticated in, in thinking about some of these issues. You know, for so long, there were some very, very sort of shop-worn, inherited narratives of immigration, and books stayed relatively the same. And about seven years ago, something started to change. You know, we started to get a little bit more, um, I, I, I described it in, in a piece I wrote, like, you know, th these were not narratives of arrival anymore. These were, arri these were narratives of, of, of amputation, of spiritual death. Of, of recursion, people coming and going back, or coming and saying, 
but what's left? What what really arrived? Um, what's what's going to survive this? And in the last, I think, two or three years, we've started to see a lot of Western, not a lot, but like a good number of, of some of our more significant novelists, Western novelists, tried to write about the migration crisis and, and to write in a way that sort of unravels a lot of the narratives that we've in inherited and, and really sort of grapple with a lot of the things that Patrick was talking about, positionality, framing. Um, how do I even situate myself in this story? Is bringing it up somehow self-serving? Um, how, how do I ask these questions? How do I frame these questions, but at the same time keep my attention on this person's story? Um, and, those, and so these books that I'm referring to in this very nebulous way, some of them are Jenny Erpenbeck's Go Went Gone. Valeria Luiselli had a book that came out this year called Last Ch Lost Children Archive. Um, Lisa Halliday has a book called Asymmetry. And these are very different books, and they all tell very different stories. But at the heart of it, there is a Western person sort of coming into contact with the figure of the migrant. Um, and... and both getting, we both get a sense of the story, we get a sense of the stakes, but we also see somebody really, really grappling with storytelling in general and and um, trying to fit a way to stuff some of their anxieties and questions and, and broader philosophical questions in there without hijacking the story. So um, in my sort of long-winded, circuitous way, that's some of the, that's some of the, the things that I'm seeing, and fiction is very well suited to it because fiction is a self-questioning genre. You know, it can comment on itself, it can uh, change forms, it can be very subtle. And you know, to that point that you had, that I really, and I was, when you said this, I was like, this is such a, you know, that idea of like empathy exhaustion. W what is the reporter supposed to do? Not report, report less, scrub out details. But then I was thinking that, no, what you're doing exists alongside art. What you're doing exists alongside novels and plays and music. And, you know, when we think about the, the narratives and the stories and the texts that make some of these things feel real, what is it? It's Mantua on Partition. It's Jacob Lawrence on The Great Migration. It's The Jungle, the play that just, you know, is sort of, it was just in New York. So, I mean, these, there are these things that exist alongside what you're doing and I think that we don't often get to talk about these two worlds existing together um, so thank you for that chance. Paru, thank yeah. you thank you very much and I think you make a very important point one that I encounter when I write about this life world of mm. migration mm. which is that the archive of migration now mm. is vast because there's not there's the journalistic mm -hmm. mode there's the art mode there's the literary mode there is of course the legal um, um, discourse too, which is often, which often bears the weight of witnessing in a very uh, different way, but it happens. And then there is the iPhone, there is the uh, you know the, the text, there is Facebook. All these issues become part of the archive of migration. And how do we track it? And how do we store it? And where do we keep it? And I and I think. For some, you know, I, I was reading um, a, 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 a testimony by a migrant who said, my iPhone is my entire familial memory. I have photographs of the homes. Reading another one, so on my, with the night I knew I was leaving, or the week I knew I was leaving, I embroidered my skirt. Is that from your book or somewhere else? I embroidered my skirt with scenes from my, the town which I came from. So I just think the archive is massive. It's text and textile and vinyl and all kinds of things. To ask, what is the witness of the activist lawyer, both in court and in as a, as a participant in a larger movement, making the opinion and then the legal opinion, making the public opinion and then the legal opinion? Yeah, I mean... I I think that much of this talk, and thank you very much for Patrick, um, was about kind of categories. And as Perul says, you know, the law is obviously very interested in uh, words as well and their kind of the legal um, uh, status that they infer. And you set up um, this kind of idea of observer and participant. And um, I think at times seem to try to want to escape, um, both in your talk and perhaps in your work, into a kind of role of advocate. That you know this sort of third third 
place and between two of the, these kind of two uh, binaries. And I think that's sort of what the Refugee Convention 1951 tries to do uh, with regards to refugees. It took a situation and kind of before the war where you were either a citizen or a non-citizen and it recognised that actually between those binaries there was this escape perhaps into a, another status which should have kind of legal rights. Um, and I suppose what's going on at the moment seems to me is that um, these uh, important precarious um, uh, uh, middle statuses are kind of under attack. And so... Um, you know, the refugee, as, as both of you have mentioned, you know, has a certain uh, kind of legal status with rights attached to it. The economic migrant does not. And this kind of conflation that is constantly at work between the two, I think, serves to undermine the kind of legal status of the refugee as this intermediate. And, you know, as an advocate, as an escape from the binary of observer or participant, I mean, my work as a lawyer in, in Turkey, um, the advocate has started to be associated with those they are seeking to represent and, and uh, the allegations against those they seek to represent. So um, uh, lawyers are putting, being put in, in jail for representing journalists or p politicians with um, whose uh, positions the government doesn't like. And then on migration specifically, those you know working on refugee boats um, trying to uh, save migrants from the sea have increasingly been arrested for uh, people uh, smuggling, um, people trafficking. And so I, I wonder kind of what's going on here a little bit is a reassertion of these binaries. You know, you are legal or you are illegal. You are uh, a citizen or a non-citizen. And these kind of middle places which reflect the complexity of the world as it is that we work very hard legally to create are now kind of being diminished. Now, that's really interesting. The, the refugee, in a way, is a category in between, a sort of a liminal category. Um, um, is, 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 an, is an important way in which we could talk about law, literature, and journalism, you know, as a kind of, um, as, as a kind of a conjunction. Because if you think about the 1951 Refugee Convention, it always, it strikes me, and when I talk to lawyers like this, they, they sort of slightly guffaw, or they're a little bit more polite and laugh into their handkerchiefs, but... But it strikes me that there are two moments here. There is the moment of crossing the border, which then puts you in a place of making a claim. Am I right? Mm -hmm. you know, making a claim. So that's more the jurisdictional issue, it, uh, you know, to be, it, the international issue. Crossing the border, being in a place to, uh, to, to claim a certain legal identity and protection. Mm -hmm. But then... The second part of it, and I, have, I split the, the two conditions, is the narrativity, which is where you have to prove that you have a real fear of persecution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to individually, if if just let me see if I get it right, you don't have to individually have experienced that, but others in your position or like you may have experienced it, but now, before the officer, whoever she or she is, you have to prove that there is a real fear of persecution in the future. Mm -hmm. So this is almost, there are two different temporalities, the time of, of, of crossing and then this whole narrativity. And in fact, in the, um, uh, in the great book on the refugee convention by, help me, the, the, the lawyer with the, huh? Goodwin Gill, that's right. Thank you. In Goodwin Gill's book, he says, how the law can't deal with these temporal disjunctions. That's why he says, you know, legally, it's difficult. That's why he says we depend on a case-by-case -case approach. I think, you know, the narrative problem and the jurisdictional problem are rather like Proust. I often think the same question of entangled time on which you've got to tell the story, convince somebody that in the future something is happening, you have the fear of something that you knew in the past. So it seems to me that narrative, which all three of you deal with in different ways, is so much part of the status of the law on migration, as well as the literature, and then of course, the journal, and in your, in your talk was so much about narrativity. So I want to take a narrative term from what you said, zooming in and zooming out. 
And I'd like you to say a little bit more about that, because for you it was not simply a problem in writing. It was also a problem, an ethical problem. It's also a knowledge, epistemological problem. Do I give the big picture? Do I give the small? How do I balance the two? And that question of scale is as much uh, an ethical issue as indeed it is an issue of information and reportage. How do, how do you work with that scale? Well, on a, I mean, on a practical level, yeah. as a journalist, it's, it, it's very difficult because to focus on, on that wider narrative, it, if you, the logistics of getting to Niger or getting to uh, some part of uh, a remote part of Libya, it's very tricky, and that, that takes weeks uh, sometimes to prepare and to, and to travel. In the meantime, there are, there are m many different um, events happening on a day-by-day -day basis in Europe on borders. And so that creates two different timescales as, as a reporter and a witness or an advocate uh, of what's going on um, because you have, to, you have to be working on, on two di very different um, time frames at the same time. You have to have your short-term uh, short reportage where you're quickly going in and out of, of European countries and your long-term planning where you're trying to get a visa or, or trying, uh, trying to find a, a, a driver or a translator for um, a more distant part of the world. And so in the process of trying to create these two different narratives, you're also working on, on two different very practical time frames. And that wasn't yeah, necessarily what yeah. you were asking for, but it, it yeah. does add an, another element of, of, of temporality to it. And then putting the, the zooming in on a specific thing and then putting it in a larger, say, global framework, that tension, how does that tension work? Um, well, if you, if you zoom out and you try to show these like much longer-term um, uh, longer term forms of migration that have been going on for decades rather than just months or weeks um, uh, that is a that is a, a very different time scale to suddenly a new new border becomes a new flashpoint um, in eastern europe uh, you know the the, the, sum, the summer of 2015 was one of um, something new happening every day every week and it, and it and it and it felt momentous, and it felt like you were in the middle of um, this extraordinary moment, uh, and that migration had never happened before, and that it was suddenly happening here in Europe. Whereas, if you zoom out, you realise people are, are, are often on the move in many different places in equally dramatic ways, but it doesn't have the lens of the Western reporter on it, um, and. Those are quite clearly two very different <laughs> forms of, of, of time uh, and, and, um, and interaction. So, Paul, this framing of time is, of course, so central to fiction yeah. in, in so many ways. And even the fictions yeah. you mentioned, uh, yeah. time is such a category of both historical representation and the representation of the inner landscape right. of the characters and also the writer. Yeah. Can you... I can. But can I? Can I do something else yeah. instead? Okay. So I just want to, because my mind is moving this other direction, which is, as it will. And you, you know, you mentioned that the, the narrative problems or the narrative challenges that face the, the journalist or the narrative problems that face the novelist. And I was also just thinking about the narrative problem that faces the refugee or the migrant, right? Having to force your experience into narrative mm -hmm. can feel like an absolutely abnormal, violent strange act. In the book that I mentioned before, Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli, who's a Mexican, American, I think that's how she ID's novelist, came out of her work working with unaccompanied minors, um, and she was working as a translator, but she was also working on almost editing their stories, trying to help them prove their case, and taking it to the lawyers, and saying, well, does this prove enough threat? Is, Is this it that book, Tell Me Where It Ends? Yes, or that's right, that's right. And then she went, and she then so it was a nonfiction book, and then she went and she sort of wrote this like large, big, sprawling novel that's based on it. Um, you know, so I was, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about, um, like, and I'd mentioned this also before, the Jacob Lawrence. People know the Jacob Lawrence Great Migration mm -hmm. Series. It's a series of paintings that he did, 60 paintings that he did in 1941 about the Great Migration. And there are these beautiful, haunting images. There was a big show at MoMA a few years ago 
And I was looking at them the other day and I was noticing that, and I was trying to find the source of their power, you know, because they're very simple, you know, primary colors. There are no faces in those paintings. Mm -hmm. They're completely faces. And nobody mentions that really. Nobody talks about it, that they're essentially almost these block paintings of, of gestures and of families together and everybody is very beautiful bearing and beautiful posture but they're clearly on the move clearly there's distress once or twice there'll be like a, the figure of a child isolated but I was thinking about that facelessness and I was thinking about some of what happens during this process of migration and, and being a refugee and I'm a child of partition you know I come from a partition sort of inheritance and thinking about you know the changes that are happening the changes to identity the changes to all forms of sense of self, and then to have to create a narrative in that moment is, um, is something that does not get, I feel, talked about, and something that I think a lot of the fiction that I mentioned, um, through the sort of character of the Westerner interested in migration, interested in, in these people in flux, is, is sort of trying to tease out and trying mm. to say, well then, um, right, who do you become when you're sort of being forced to conform to you know, these particular kinds of bureaucratic definitions of self. I, I, yeah, um, jump in on that. I mean, yes, um, the, the narrative that, you, that migrants have to create for themselves that, to get legal status at various things, is, uh, at, various, at various points, is obviously um, uh, very salient. But I also wanted to sort of talk about uh, the, the narratives that they create for their own understanding and the ways in which... Um, their understanding is broadened by uh, the kind of ma group of people, friends, uh, neighbours, etc., who they're on a journey and uh, and, wh and whose boundaries are expanding with them. And um, my wife and I used to uh, teach um, some uh, Syrian kids in Istanbul um, English to try and get into uh, universities in this country. And then after refugee, um, the, the Muslim ban um, uh, into Canadian universities, and and for many of them, their conception of uh, the world. Uh, outside Syria didn't include uh, them. They imagined lives, obviously, in their country. And what changed is um, after the war began and, and people started leaving, is that they then started posting on their Facebook uh, mini feeds or whatever, uh, you know, pictures of them in front of the Eiffel Tower or pictures of them, you know, uh, in front of the Brandenburg Gate. Or And suddenly the kind of the understanding that individuals had of the potential parameters um, of their world and the narrative in which you know they could conceive of themselves like massively expanded and therefore you know for these kids sitting in Istanbul the idea of suddenly trying to get to Sweden or trying to get to Denmark or Berlin or anywhere was suddenly a thing that was conceivable and imaginable and something they might actually do whereas before it hadn't been at all and I mean, on this point as well, I just wanted to ask Patrick about, at one point, you basically give Hashim a notebook and a camera, and you, there's this wonderful Guardian article where, you, where he documents himself. And I wonder if you could talk about that process and like the thinking or the complexity behind... I mean, here he is, like a participant observer of a real kind. I mean, you bought your wetsuit, but he, like, mm. you know, he had to go and giving him a camera and so on. I wonder if you could talk about that. Definitely, no. I mean, it's a, it's a really vexing um, ethical question. Uh, you're essentially asking someone to commit a form of journalism for you, unpaid, um, and uh, to risk their lives while doing it. I mean, you can frame it another way. You can, you can frame it as a, as a choice. But How did he frame it? I think in his mind, this was a this was a worthy thing to be involved in. I framed it in the, as, as something that could uh, achieve empathy within like a, a European population that was confused about what was happening, and that this could increase awareness. Um, but yet, it, 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 because I wasn't on the boat, because he was writing his diary, which then I would use to recreate the story of what he experienced on the boat um, and because he did use a little camera I gave him he he was the journalist in that situation um, which which in one sense is as I said prob very problematic because he's doing the work of journalism for you the journalist uh, who's actually getting paid for it 
but at the same time, it's actually a still very rare form of self um, uh, narrative, uh, self description, um, self uh, self assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, we, st you know, it was interesting that the, the the novels that you mentioned earlier are all about a Western uh, protagonist coming to terms with um, uh, a migrant that they previously. Or a migration or, or groups of migrants. I, I haven't read those books. Mm -hmm. I apologise, but I, that's what it sounded like. Mm -hmm. They were not mm -hmm. uh, novels about a migrant's experience. Mm -hmm. And it's the same in journalism and um, many other fields. I, uh, I think Lena Dunham has been yep. uh, given the role of writing a, a screenplay about uh, migration from Syria. And that's another example of... of the internet was thrilled by that. Right. <laughs> Fully supported. But I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to just jump on her when I'm doing exactly the same thing, and that's problematic. It's problematic that it's people uh, like me who are not from Syria who are narrating a, a Syrian migration. Let me ask you one final question before we before we open up. Um, you know, it's we all say in our different ways it's problematic. It's problematic. And people have been saying it's problematic, the treachery of the clerks, where a bit, you know, participant observation. It's problematic, it's problematic. Mm -hmm. um, should we have a way of taking responsibility for the fact that it's problematic, as we all try and do, and say, because it's problematic, we're trying to do X or Y, or this is the way we are functioning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe... It, it is problematic, but there is also a way out of it. There's, it. This problematicness is necessary in some ways in the world in which we live. And it's just a confronting the inequalities of the world, confronting the different fates, uh, historical fates in the world. The question I want to really ask you before we open up is, again, about the word crisis. I want to ask each of you, many of these novels have a sense of cri a, a critical moment, you know, a moment of, uh, of, of a specific kinds of crises or crises. You, uh, Patrick, experienced something, and in your talk here you said, you know, at one level it's a crisis, but maybe, you know, there's a, there's a longer narrative, it's the zoom in, zoom out problem in a different way. And Tobias, you know, often, I often think that people talk about the crisis in order then to let policy wonks come in on it, or certain NGOs come in on it, and they do so with some passion. But then, if, it, if, if things don't work out, then they say, well, of course we couldn't work it out. It's a crisis. Look, we've got to deal with this huge problem. So how can we get the sa satisfactory thing? It's all a crisis. Now we did crisis management. Mm -hmm. So I just want, from different aspects, just to have a quick conversation about crises, and then we can open up to our so, I, I mean, I think um, we talked about empathy fatigue, and um, I think crisis breeds legal fatigue as well, or fatigue of the institutions of law that were a protective regime that was set up after Second World War, you know, the Refugee Convention 1951, then in the EU, this, uh, these Dublin treaties to try and share um, as migra uh, migrants arrived on, uh, you know, the, the border countries of uh, Europe to share them amongst uh, amongst different countries. Um, and that kind of legal protection, I think um, what this crisis showed is it's sort of inversely related to its need. I mean, at the moment it was most required, it kind of rolled over and basically everyone reneged on their commitments under the Dublin treaties. The, you know, this uh, deal with Turkey was signed instead of uh, continuing to accept um, uh, migrants into the EU. So. Um, I think, you know, these kind of uh, uh, legal statuses also get um, kind of fatigued and uh, rights that were thought to be kind of universal become quite clearly contingent, um, politicized. Um, and I think as Masha Gessen said in the Tanner Lectures a couple of weeks ago, you know, the, 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 it, it starts to become a question of if there are too many legals, we better start calling them illegals. And, and so the system kind of gets... Um, Overwhelmed. So I think that's sort of part of my sense of 
I'm not sure of that. Just, just, <laughs> just a footnote to that. Penny Erpenbeck's Go When Gone is mm -hmm. uh, the deep structural crisis yeah. is the Dublin Treaty. Mm -hmm. That's the main mm -hmm. plot, in a way, of, mm -hmm. the, of the book. Mm -hmm. Patrick, crisis. Um, you experienced I mean, I, a crisis. I, 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 would st I still use the word expression migration crisis as a shorthand. I, I feel it's, it, it's not the worst expression, but it, it isn't really a migration crisis. The, the more people arrive as tourists in, on, on summer days in, in, uh, in Italy and Greece than, than, than would arrive by, by leaking boat from Turkey. Um, uh, and I th but I think it, it, is, it is a crisis in the sense of it's a crisis of identity uh, for both the refugees because they are leaving behind their homelands and going somewhere new. It's a crisis for liberal Europeans or, or uh, liberal Americans or leftist Americans uh, and, and leftist Europeans, like who who are we? You know, is is this continent Europe really the the, the, the place that we imagine it to be? It's also a, a crisis for of, of, of identity for the right. It, you know, is is this still Christian Europe? Uh, are we losing our, our, our sense of uh, you know centuries old um, Christian heritage? Uh, and the second thing it's a crisis about is is of of border management. It, we, there, there is still a crisis in that sense because all the problems that we found out about the Dublin Treaty and the legal mechanisms that would could redistribute people and the, and the political um, uh, will to 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 redistribute people among European countries that still hasn't been solved. That was in essence the the, the problem, the reason why it appeared so chaotic in the first place was because none of these legal systems were working, and today. We still don't have a new system. We have Emmanuel Macron, who wants to create a pan-European uh, migration uh, and asylum system, and we have a bunch of other countries that don't want that. So they're still at loggerheads. They still can't agree, and, and that is still a, a, a political crisis. It's, it, it's, but it is a border management crisis. It's not necessarily a migration crisis. That's very well. So it's a crisis of how you receive people and what mechanisms and instruments you have for that. Yeah. And so I think my, in terms of fiction's response to the crisis, what I think is interesting in some of the books I mentioned, and just more broadly, is a sort of suspicion of empathy, which I think is very welcome. You know, sort of looking at this thing about a lot of these books, like it's not enough to sort of just show us the story of objection. James Wood has a very smart phrase, we just don't want to be the moral flaneur touring other people's traumas. We don't want that story anymore. And I think a lot of the, the wave of these books are interesting to me, not because they're Westerners reporting or talking about their sort of, you know, like a driving this daisy scenario, to, like tell me how it is for you. No, I think it's because these, these books in a very structural way and at like a very language-based way are trying to ask for something more than the satisfaction of feeling the right feeling. Mm -hmm and feeling, you know, moved or having, you know, all sorts of strings plucked. No, they're trying to say, well, what information don't we have? What is our complicity? What are the histories we don't know? And actually, when is shame an absolutely appropriate response? You know, and maybe that's another. So I think, I think that these kinds of emotional registers, these kinds of sorts of ways of pushing back on our expected emotional responses to these stories feels very useful to me. And I think you made a very important distinction there. You know, the language very often of the observer or the writer in relation to these issues, people always think it's guilt. You know, as a witness, right. you're guilty. Maybe it's shame, and they're not the same thing. Yeah. But that's for another conversation. Now I want to open up to the audience. Please uh, show your hands and introduce yourselves. Is there a mic? Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm Irv Plotkin, primary member of the community and the ART. Uh, I want to go back to Patrick's first problem that you put out, that you were worrying as a reporter, you were observing, but are you changing what's happening and should you intervene with your, with your debit card? And uh, you're clearly conflicted and troubled by it. And, and then the idea that misery loves company, uh, let's think about something. We're now in the philosophy building and not inappropriately for this discussion. But if we went a little further north on campus, we'd be in the science center. And if our hearing were acute, we'd hear Heisenberg talking about the observation effect, that the observer impacts the very experiment that he's observing. If we went further north, we'd be in the anthropology mm -hmm. museum, 
and we could hear Margaret Mead complaining about how do you look at a tribe that has not had contact with the rest of the world without changing it. So it's not a unique problem to reportage, although maybe it's more common now in, in that. I don't know if this will be comforting or not discomforting to you, but I think you're doing a wonderful job in, in carrying out your profession with the natural uh, impediments that beset any kind of scholarly endeavor. Can I respond? Yes, please. Uh, I think that's a very perceptive point um, in, in that uh, just by being there, even if I didn't intervene at that moment or in other moments, obviously I was impacting the way that people looked at me and Hashim as a doer. You know, if it had just been him sitting on his own in an empty carriage, he might have looked more shifty than uh, because I was accompanying him you know, with my laptop, asking him questions about how he was feeling you know, at, at, at the last border crossing. And obviously that changes how people interact with us and, and pro perhaps provides him a certain cover. Um, even if, uh, for example, on the, the, the French-Italian border, when he actually encountered the police, we were, we were apart from each other by several metres. That, that's kind of irrelevant. I was, I was still participating in, in his journey. Um, and it, even though as a journalist, I don't like to admit that, uh, it's kind of true. Thank you. The two hands. Um, hello. So I'm also a member of the community, but I'm originally Canadian. And there, there's a lot of talk happening right now around how we integrate indigenous perspectives into research and uh, decision making and other parts of life. And one big piece of this is recognizing our relationships with other people in the research we're doing, not anonymizing people, um, as well as in the conversations we have and how we make decisions is, is putting those relationships first. And so I'm interested in how this relates to this question of witness versus participant and whether within journalism there's conversations happening about um, how we uh, maybe place more importance on these relationships um, and including and in reflecting on them in, in the way we're writing. So just re can you just clarify relationships between journalists so and who? your relationship with Hashim, mm. right? And um, you recognize yourself that you are a participant, right? You said this at the end, that even in these instances where you were um, trying to act as a witness, you were still a participant. And so I'm wondering around how you um, integrate this realization into your writing. I'm not sure I do, to be honest. I, th I think you, you, uh, you you're, you're, I mean, as a, as a reporter at least, you're always trying to distance yourself from the action. If you refer to yourself, sometimes it's a, a Guardian reporter, or a, a New York Times reporter, and um, to an extent, you're always trying to obscure the relationship between yourself and the person that I was trailing in that moment, or um, uh, that I'm quoting in another moment. Uh, and maybe the relationship is actually quite thin, and, and it was only formed in the, the la in, a, in a couple of minutes at, at a protest. And then you're on to the next person, or maybe it's like Hashim, it's someone that I've been getting to know for months. Um, but perhaps there isn't enough honesty about uh, the, the the background to to your relationship with that person. That said, you know, the accompanying that particular article was a blog post by me explaining that relationship. Maybe the place for that explanation was in the article itself. Maybe it wasn't. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted and unsure of what the right answer is. So, uh, Parul, I wanted to ask you this. Yeah. Ask, uh, I want yes. to just ask a follow-up question, because I think that, I mean, it feels now, I mean, just from where you and I work, there feels like there's so much commentary on our journalism, whether it's the podcast or the, like, notebooks that reporters write. Like, there does seem to be a hunger on the part of the reader to understand more about these relationships and more about how people like you do your job. Is that something you welcome? Is that something you think is good for the profession? Yes, because I think we need to, to be a bit more honest about uh -huh. the fact that we aren't just the view from nowhere. Right. And what's hiding behind that neutral language all Ex the time. Exactly. Yeah. And I think we, we, we try to imagine that we don't have mm -hmm. a complex series of biases, whether personally or institutionally. But 
inevitably there is a certain framework in which you're operating and um, I think it's good that there are more mm -hmm. notebooks on page mm -hmm. two of the Times kind of explaining how a certain moment works or you know I, I think our colleague Declan Walsh wrote a piece about what it's like to be in Yemen when there's a famine and you have literally thousands of dollars yeah. that you're bringing to pay translators or drivers or fixers or, or for visas or hotels or anything like that. How do, how do you navigate that moral space? I think it's good that we're talking about but it. But that moral space is also an institutional space. Surely the Times doesn't say do this or don't do this, but when you write for a paper like that, it's not just your anonymity. It's also that the paper prescribes a kind of institutional institutional, not maybe neutrality in some cases, or a kind of more ecumenical thing, don't go. So what is that? How does that work? No, no editor tells you, don't put yourself in it, right? Oh, well, they will. Oh, do they? They, will. <laughs> they say to you, don't put yourself in it. Well, I mean, the, the, it, in, in the Times, for example, you notice maybe two years ago, they started to put I mm -hmm. in a few different news stories mm -hmm. to, to, to show to readers that the reporters are actually in, in the places that they're writing about. And then there was a, uh, a feeling that maybe that wasn't necessary. So, there, I mean, there is, a, there is a discussion about the extent to which we put ourselves in these pieces, but uh, it is nevertheless uh, not a personal... I wouldn't say it's a personal choice. I mean, this is an institutional... It's an institution. Yeah. In the broader convention, like, that's where the trust comes from. But right? as, a, as, a, as a reviewer, as a literary and cultural yeah. reviewer, again... Is, is there's a different kind of distance there. Right, right. I mean, and I think I think it is I think it is loosening a little bit more. And I think my contract with the reader is very different, especially because I write every week. So there is a little bit more familiarity. You know, if I were writing something else before, I sort of was writing for the daily section. There was a little bit more impersonality, but now I feel very comfortable to wield adjectives and pronouns around. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful, really wonderful talk and actually also very thoughtful comments. Um, Patrick, you, you talked about various tensions, um, I think very, very forcefully. Um, and you talked about, and, and Tobias picked this up, about the problem of kind of um, empathy creep or empathy waning. Um, what about a tension you didn't talk about, which I imagine you must have confronted and must confront again and again, is the tension between, you know, deeply immersing yourself in the unwinding of a narrative like Hashim's narrative and picking kind of, um, you know, very um, powerful, iconic moments, you know, we can think of several in the migration crisis, which really then, however much fatigue there is, suddenly give a new boost to empathy. So going for f from the, you know, really careful cumulative reporting of a life unfolding in many different contexts to sens what you might call sensationalism or even some sort of humanitarian pornography of, of looking at, you know, death, particularly death of a child, or death of a pregnant woman, or a fetus, you know, the kind of thing which which really forces people into a visceral reaction. So um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you make those choices, because after all, your time is also, and your, your newsprint is a st scarce commodity on something as urgent as a issue like this, you know, you don't, you, you're Just making clear, a choice. The, the choice... Your, well, your choice to spend your time, for example, following a person and, and, and gradually, you know, documenting, you know, him kind of stumbling along in the in the late night uh, context and so on, as opposed to really chasing after ambulances, chasing after uh, kind of real, yeah, sensational crises, which presumably you could also do. So I um, wonder if you if you make that choice or if you always will take the crisis, the, the sensational thing when it happens, and when there isn't, then you do more cumulative. I, I think it has to be a discussion with your editor, and, and I was lucky that year to have an editor who also saw the value not just of flinging me or others at, at uh, you know, the, late, the latest flashpoint, um, but also saw the, the value in, in, spe in spending time and investing in longer longer narratives um, 
I, just, I mean, it's, it's, if it's a large news organization, you can do both. You can have people that are you know, spending that week going to the Macedonian border because suddenly it's become a flashpoint, and you can have me spending that same week uh, following Hashim around. It doesn't, it doesn't have to... I, I, I would love it if it was sort of a particularly kind of uh, subtle... Uh, calculation, but really, if you have enough reporters, you can do all these things at, at the same time. But what you also do in the book, uh, and then I know we have two questions here, but what you do in the book is um, um, talk, when you talked about Alan Kurdi, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you you talk about that, you talk about the, you know, the, the crisis it provoked, the, um, the, the, the way in which the European Council, the, they, they, Preponed, as they say in India, rather than put, they preponed their meeting to deal with this and so on and so forth. And then you pull back and you say the same week, as it outside Amsterdam, there was a truck full of dead Austria. bodies. Huh? Yeah, outside? Austria. Oh, in Austria, there was a truck full of dead bodies. People didn't even know what this truck was doing until these kind of fetid, you know, smells and 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 fluid started coming out of it, and they found. There were all these suffocated migrants. So, in fact, you do that. You know, there's the long story that you give, and you look at the Alan Kurdi at the same time. So I think it's possible to do it in one narrative. It's not just but, uh, two journalists. It's sort of making a juxtaposition. But then that's, that's, just, that's, that's just a quite a simple reading of the news that year. It's, no, it's noticing that, okay, this particular moment was something that, that drew... Uh, a lot of public attention and sympathy or empathy. Uh, but that wasn't to do with me. That wasn't to do with me saying, right, we're going to focus on Alan Curdy today. That was just the fact that for some reason, for reasons well beyond my control or, or insight, th those became uh, media flashpoints. Yeah, but Patrick, you said everybody focused on this, but that other event was not as well reported. As I recall, the the the, the Austrian, buy. and that's what I'm saying is that you know you give something that is does catch the world's eye, and you shadowed it, juxtaposed it very nicely with something that didn't, and which was, you know, equally horrific. I mean, people dying of suffocation. Uh, anyway, but I'm just saying that it's this idea of long distance, short distance, day to day reporting and crisis reporting. You can do it in the same narrative as I think your book does many, many times. Yes, questions. There are two questions here. Yeah, two I mean, people this here. is kind of more of a technical rather than philosophical question. But could you just kind of outline like the different the the different experience a refugee would have coming in 2015 when everyone just walked, how that changed up to now, like what the legal situation and how it changed? Because I... I know there was the EU-Turkey deal, and that said people could go back to Turkey, but very few people did go back to Turkey, yet it seemed to have really changed the experience on the ground. Why, and, and can, if you could just briefly outline it. I will try and do that. Maybe Tobias can also bring his insights of, of researching uh, life for refugees in Turkey uh, after the deal. Um, so, in, sort of, until 2015, people kind of came in quite a haphazard way, uh, from across the Greek-Turkish border and um, to uh, the Greek islands by boat. Um, but they kind of did that uh, and then made the subsequent journey through the Balkans by themselves and they were given a, a sort of nod and a wing by the Greek authorities um, to do so. And then uh, once just the, the sheer mass of people became so large and events like the, the death of Alan Kurdi happened, then there was a there, there was a desire to kind of streamline this movement of people. So you still had to cross the Aegean Sea, the three miles of the Aegean to the Greek islands. But then the, the, the Greek government was basically bussing people to the Macedonian border. The Macedonians were bussing people to Serbia. The Serbian government were bussing people to Hungary at one point, and then when Hungary put up their fence to Croatia, and there was like a, a, a actually a sort of two or three day journey that you could make that was basically um, all controlled by the, um, the the governments of the Balkans and, and basically uh, wouldn't have happened if Merkel hadn't just acknowledged that this thing needed some coordination while in tandem uh, 
they were doing, they were having negotiations with the Turkish government, which basically involved paying the Turkish government to, to stop people from getting to the Turkish shore to get on the boats to Greece in the first place. Um, then, long story short, in March 2016, the Turks finally stopped it, uh, and simultaneously, uh, the sort of route through the Balkans um, that was previously uh, organized by, by the governments of the Balkans, that also stopped. So you had far, basically overnight, you had far fewer people being able to leave um, Turkey and far fewer people being able to leave Greece. And the result is that you still have people autonomously moving from Turkey to Greece, but far lower numbers, and you still have people moving through the Balkans, but again, far lower numbers. Um, and you have more tens of thousands of people stuck in Greece in very difficult conditions on the islands, and you have around three million Syrians and, and many more non-Syrian refugees stuck in Turkey. And it might be interesting to hear from you, Baisi, about what the life is like for, for those people who are now stuck in Turkey. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to also talk about an intermediate stage. I mean, you go through it, but... I mean, I, I was at the Macedonian-Greek border and at a time, I think, in probably early 2016 where, um, and I think this is a reflection on how reporting can change the narrative in certain ways, that uh, clearly there was a sense of, you know, needing to deal with the crisis at the border, um, but there was also a recognition that certain nationalities were um, experiencing conditions in their home countries that meant that Europe couldn't just shut them out. So we witnessed this kind of absurd um, uh, uh, kind of perverse application of the law where at the border there was now a large fence and there were border guards and if you had an Iraqi or an Afghan or a Syrian or maybe a Libyan passport you were allowed through and if you didn't it didn't matter where you came from or what your situation was if you're Eritrean, Nigerian, wherever uh, you weren't allowed through and so there was this sort of uh, middle kind of stage where as you say they were streamlined I think uh, the money that was paid to Turkey was in, was intended to kind of formalize uh, the existence of um, of many uh, refugees who were there um, kind of in a like permanent you know impermanence that, that many of them had come at the beginning of the war or, or soon after it started thinking that it would finish within six months or so and therefore never you know learned Turkish enrolled their children in schools sought proper accommodation, uh, got proper jobs, etc. They were making do, and that making do was then stretching for, you know, five years, six years, seven years. So I think what the deal did a little bit was, one, as you say, stopped people leaving. It also um, gave people legal status to work, although the amount of, uh, the number of permits was, like, extremely small, and from my experience, and I imagine this is what your experience was as well. Most um, of the three million refugees who were in Turkey didn't somehow transform into these legal uh, workers overnight. Um, but I think in general, uh, this process of integration, into, well, of formalized uh, and permanent existence has been ongoing. So people have been slowly trying to find better proper jobs, slowly uh, integrating, uh, like, you know, sending their kids to school, learning the language, these kind of things are going on slowly. But I think at first always with a mind to going home. And now, I mean, for many people, I wonder what they think there is to go home to. I mean, speaking to many people in Turkey, they think, you know, there's no water, there's no electricity, there's no internet, there's no family, there's no home. There's So I think for many people, the decision not to go on to Europe and now that decision has, you know, that option has been foreclosed and the decision to re return home doesn't really exist. So many people have just um, are trying to live their lives in Turkey, I suppose. The lady, you, 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 you had a question, did you? Yes. Well, um, so my, my question, I, I'm not sure if that's even relevant to you, but my question would have been whether um, you're positioning yourself in these two uh, sides of crises between the left and the right and whether, so that would be one question and, and you have partly answered that question I think in your talk and but the other would be is there a similarity in reaction on these two sides or, or in perception of this crisis that you 
um, observe, so, or, yeah, is cruelty as a result of exhaustion something that unites them, I wonder? Um, well, just taking that last point, uh, personally, I, d I don't necessarily feel that a response to dwindling empathy is just to stop reporting, but it is nevertheless something that concerned me, and it was something that I thought about. Uh, I don't, th I don't think actually cruelty is something that unites left and right. I think, in fact, what a lot of the reporting did was maybe it grew too much for s for some pockets of of of, of um, the public and and those are the people that you know were writing underneath articles saying that I wish these people would die, would die. But I think it also really um, bolstered a sense among another section of the population that we have to go down to Calais and bring all our spare laundry and for these people to, to, to wear. Or we have to go to the islands of um, Greece and, and help res rescue refugees from, from their boats as they arrive. And so it, it created, I, I think it, it, it basically polarised uh, reactions, but it didn't necessarily stop some people from, be from becoming like much more empathetic to the extent that they were really going down to... To, to the flashpoints and, and, and trying to organise themselves. And the, the difference between being on the Greek islands in June 2015 and being there in November was that there was like one family that was helping people once they arrived on the, on the north shores of Lesbos in June. By November or December, suddenly you had seven or eight new uh, N, uh, NGOs that had just been founded in the last two months to, to, to deal with all these people arriving from Turkey by boat. And then just on that point, did I consider myself as a, in the middle of left, left and right? I mean, I, feel that I think as a journalist, there's enormous pressure to, 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 to be in the middle and to be <coughs> balanced. Uh, but I, I, I think if you go back and read my reporting from that time, it, uh, I think it's pretty clear that... The, <laughs> the sympathies that I had at, 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 at that time. Yeah, now the last question here, please. Oh, two, two, oh, three, one, two, and three. <laughs> then we just have to close, yeah. The, 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 yes, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Venezuelan. Uh, Venezuela is probably outside of your area of uh, geographic area of focus. But I'm, uh, I'm very interested in if you have any views or what is your perspective on what is happening in Venezuela right now in terms of the massive migration uh, in the, since 2016. And they expect that by the end of this year we'll have 5 million Venezuelans living in Venezuela. Uh, what I have seen in the news, what is being covered in, by the New York Times and some other European uh, newspapers, it's really more about what is happening in Venezuela. I don't see much about the migrant experience or what is happening to those who have left. Um, so I wonder what your perspective on, on the Venezuelan situation is, on the migration part. Can I ask a clarification? Are most Venezuela There's a very large migration to Colombia, is that right? Yes. Is that the main... Numerically, yeah. Yeah, uh, apparently like 6,000 uh, Venezuelans are leaving daily, and they mostly do it through Colombia. It's just that because the Venezuelan government closes the, the Cucuta uh, bridge, uh, sometimes it's on and off, but they find ways to walk out. Okay, <laughs> we you. find ways to walk out. I just wanted to clarify where the main migration flow is. Yep. Venezuela. I feel like this is maybe a question for, for you as a, as a <laughs> consumer of... I agree. I feel like, yeah, I, don't, I haven't seen much. I mean... Nicholas Kristof had something, I think it was today or yesterday. Was it? In the time yeah. About yeah. Uh, in Colombia. Hmm. I mean, we saw it before the midterms, right? Uh, being instrumentalized by uh, Trump. Um, and I think that reminds me a lot of um, the Brexit referendum we had in the UK, where people were told, you know, that it, Turkey shares a border with Syria and Iraq, and that three million, uh, that 70 million, 80 million Turks were going to turn up. So these 
I think there are obvious um, parallels in the ways in which this kind of vague fear um, of being overrun, of crisis, of these things we've been talking about is clearly operationalized by the right for electoral benefit, but I haven't seen much reporting on it otherwise. But there is another issue about borders that I think we should just touch on before we go, and something that I, uh, Hannah Arendt wrote about in The Origins of Totalitarianism, where she says, when you start having these flows, sorry to use that word, or these, these stop and start fibrillations, or whatever you want to call it, um, suddenly the police become, play the role of governments. You know, they, it's somehow the police forces get a kind of almost autonomy. So it's like a police at the borders, the police make up their own rules. You know, there's a kind of, they generate customs and all kinds of things that would otherwise not be allowed. And I just think that policing, it's, this is not the police state, but at the borders, it can often be like a police state. And I just think that that's worth, that's a point just I, worth. I, 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 I agree that the police are sort of act, sometimes act, acting outside of the law, often when they're pushing people back, whether it's on the Greek border or the Hungarian border. But I would question whether that is ne nevertheless outside of the, the awareness of central government. At, at the very least, there, there is a sort of don't ask, don't, don't tell, tell no. about what's going on at the board. No, I agree. It's not outside, but I'm saying it is a practice that develop its, it develops its own dynamism to some extent. It's not as if the government doesn't, the central government doesn't want it, or, or want you know, I'm sure they want it, but it just, it's worth thinking about it mm. as, a, as a particular political form that develops on the border. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know. so, so yes, and then finally here, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Mehtap. I'm from Turkey. Uh, so actually, I don't know if it's a question, but I was uh, thinking about Jacob Lawrence and then your reporting, Hashim, and then the uh, uh, immigrants that you represented. They are all faceless and they don't have kind of uh, voice at all, although we see Hashim's face since um, this long temporality that you've been there is uh, squished in a, or condensed in a narrative, it becomes a different temporality for the reader, uh, for the people who look at that images, for the people who read that literature, or like in Turkey right now, Osman Kavala's case, like we are just reading the end uh, reports because it's like, it becomes very like, the time that you lived and you experienced um, with them is very long, but as like as opposed to other readers uh, or like um, like the observance, it's very short. And then we are trying to create empathy in a way, and that means we are asking the question, what's our responsibility? But then I am thinking. Uh, what's, uh, how can we hear the voice of the people that you are representing and narrating? And what is the, uh, what are their rights as a human? I don't want to say human rights because like our country doesn't care about human rights. And then since you are stuck in particular countries, what are your rights? as opposed to a citizen's rights. Like, yeah, you, you wanna work, but you can't work. But then, uh, your hum as a human, your right is to be safe, is that it? Or like, um, so what am I trying to say is like, we just are all- Just ask the question. I, right yeah, up, like, I know, it's like a command. I was no. just thinking about my experience. What is, how can I make my voice heard and, uh, these stories doesn't create empathy for me, but it creates action for me, which I can't act on it. Because I don't have the kind of rights or the tools, or I had my own self-censorship because of the particular reasons. Uh, right. That's what Thank I'm yeah, asking. And it's like, what's your, how, uh, how is your 
like response, not responsibility, but how could you contribute in that, like changing that narration, rather than not being maybe, uh, it's not the question of, I think, being a witness or participant, but actually we really need to be participants. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to at least acknowledge that we are participants in that situation. And we need to acknowledge who, what, who are our comrades like in that situation. There's lots of grapple with, within your statement, um, which is very interesting. Um, I think, I mean, I, I agree, and as I tried to get out in, in my talk, the, you know, focus on someone like Hashim is, is, a, is, a compromise, is a compromised process because in one sense, you are trying to show what's in his head, but you know, I spent t months with him, uh, maybe a dozen interviews, try, trying to understand, so at that moment, you know, what are you thinking? Right now, what are you thinking as you sit on the train? And you're trying to show the, w his voice, but obviously it is um, all uh, construed through me, mm -hmm. um, my interpretation of him, and, and that's really problematic. Uh, I, how do we move beyond, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. it being problematic? Uh, I, th I think ultimately it involves less people like me doing this kind of journalism and more people from Syria writing about uh, migration. Uh, that process is going to take time and to extend it. I think if you looked at the people who are foreign correspondents for international newspapers right now, it's, it's probably more diverse than maybe it ever has been, but ultimately it, it, it is still far too many people like me doing it and, and interpreting someone like Hashim rather than someone like Hashim writing um, uh, on his own behalf. So um, Hashim can't, you know, this is why I'm, I'm coming to you, sorry. Just, you know, I think we, we, we got to go ahead and grasp the problem. And Hashim doesn't want to necessarily sit and write about his life all the time for the New York Times. He doesn't want to do that. That's your job. You're a reporter. You do it the best you can. Yeah. You talk to him. You say, you know, when something happened, you ask for his interpretation. I think there's a real danger, and I'm going to be provocative here, with always emphasizing voice as if anybody's voice is unmediated, whether it's the victim's voice, whether it's the participant's voice. I think we can't, we, you know, voice is not simply expressive. Voice comes out of writing. You know, maybe Hashim says, what I want to do is I want to bring my child and put my child in school. I don't want to sit here and write about the experience mm. of what, that's your job. And I think well, there's always a kind of moral problem here. You know, am I representing, am I taking the burden of representation? I think some of us at certain times in certain places have to take the burden of representation. We get it wrong, we get it wrong. If we get it right, then Hashim says, that's a very, you know, thank you. You know, you, you managed to say something that I, I couldn't have said. Maybe in this particular instance, that makes sense. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But in a wider sense, it, it, obviously there needs to be less mediation by uh, white men. Oh, well, yeah, I, sure. I, well, yeah, of course, I'm all for I mean, less mediation. and I are not going to disagree. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to disagree. <laughs> but, but I mean, we need to... Mean, that's not our problem. <laughs> but, the, but I'm saying even, even non-white men, you know, can't mediate various situations without understanding that they're constructing something. And I think it's... In what I liked about your talk is you were very responsible in how you saw yourself, how you positioned yourself. You were not letting yourself off the hook. But, you know, writers could say, we don't want critics, you know, or philosophers, we don't want and they theorists. Frequently do. And they frequently do. And yet, they don't necessarily, or artists don't necessarily just want to sit and talk about their work. They don't mind that mediation. I'm just saying there are kinds of mediation, and mediation is an old and hoary problem, and it's... You, you, you catch it, it's problematic, but you, it, can't, it won't go away. I think it's also okay to say there are nevertheless better forms of mediation. Of course, that's that. what I'm saying. You, you get it, in, and, and you've got to say, I got it wrong. I mediated badly this time. And indeed, even a native informant might say, writing about my next-door neighbor uh, 
I didn't get it right. My next door neighbor thinks, although I share, a, 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 you know, I share the house with him, or my my roommate. Somehow I was writing about that and didn't come right. So I just think it's you judge it when it's done, and then you're big enough to say I screwed up. But there's also like a middle ground in the sense that there is now a convention of writing some of these anxieties and questions yeah. into the text, yeah. and in a way that doesn't hijack it, but does sort of explore what it means to represent the other, you know. Okay. And what it rep- you know, so I think that these are things that are happening and there are ways to sort of, yeah. you know. But I want to tend to like the more subtle point that you're asking, which is, which is just the challenge of doing this kind of work, you know, and the challenge of, of writing something that is going to arrest people in this particular way. And I think of something that Sontag said, which is that compassion is an unstable emotion. If it doesn't translate into action, it withers and people can become cynical and bored. And that's the challenge of of writing, that's the challenge of prose, that's the challenge of, of um, and it's very hard to generalize, right? For me to say, well, this is, the kind of, this is the kind of way to do it, everybody should do it. But my only response to this is to always stay very attentive to what has engendered that feeling of action in you mm. as a writer. And what com- has made you feel like yeah. something is capable, something can be done, versus the kinds of writing that make you feel like, gosh, this is, who's, somebody else mm. has to take care of this, what can I do? You know, sure. so just to stay close to those texts and to those writers that produce that feeling in you, and to sort of keep interrogating what are they doing, what is happening, because we all have had that feeling. So that's. Um, and then the, yeah. Sorry, and I'd also like to address the question of what we can do, and and I think what we've seen in 2016, for example, you know, Turkey after the coup, uh, failed coup, became the biggest jailer of journalists in the world, and at that time in late 2016, there were reports in all international papers about that fact. Uh, it was like heavily reported on. And my clients were regularly in uh, uh, news that came out of um, Turkey. And I think the story has moved on, as you say. People recategorize a country like Turkey as perhaps not this um, European-influenced kind of bridge between East and West, as the old cliche goes. And maybe it's actually just East. Maybe it's Middle East. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised that there are journalists in jail and that there aren't any, as you say, human rights there. But I think there our obligation is to remember that that isn't true. Remember that there are people like, as you say, Osman Kavala, you know, a great man of civil society in jail at the moment, that these people exist, that many people in the country continue to like hold these ideals very strongly. And just because the stories have moved on or, you know, it's not so much like in the press, in the Western press now, like our job is to like remember that this exists and try and hold on to that. The grand finale. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Marla Ramirez. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Mahindra Humanity Center, and I also <clears throat> research and write about immigration. Um, thank you for the talk and the stimulating questions and comments. Um, and I want to end with a question that builds on the discussion that the panel just had. Um, coming back to the idea of objectivity, right? I think in different fields, including academia and journalism and the law, in numerous fields, we we think about or we train to be objective, right? To to write about immigration, for instance, um, from a distance, from a distance, that like we're not as if we're not involved in the process, right? But at the same time, our training and the expectation of our publications expects us to be very involved, right? Especially under this political moment, that we had to find creative ways to investigate, right? Whether it be to follow a person for months or to do. Um, creative methodologies like uh, oral history and being in the community uh, that you're writing about, right? Um, so my question is, is objectivity now, the training of objectivity that is so centered to many of our fields, is it becoming uh, an illusion now? Should we rethink um, how we write and how we research to be able to include ourselves in the writing um, as much as we include ourselves in the process of researching what we write about? And how do we move forward? Why don't you take that? Because I that don't have so to be objective. Right. No. <laughs> so, I mean, Neither do I. <laughs> Not that point. Your question right. about there are ways in which that whole sense of anxiety, the conflict, becomes part of the writing itself. Part of the writing. That was what you were saying. Yeah, but I don't think it's in the in the forms of writing you're talking about. I don't think that you're going to be like Patrick in the middle of his 
article is going to suddenly start wrestling with these particular issues. So. But, you, but you can flack at mm -hmm. this. I think I feel like a lot of different kinds of journalistic outlets are trying to find out ways of flecking at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. subjectivity, flecking at personal agency of the writer. Uh, you know, for example, that example I mentioned a, a half an hour ago about New York Times reporters putting I now in, in what were previously quite um, uh, sort of staged uh, articles. Um, I, I agree, there is, there, is a, there is a process of kind of acknowledging a lack of complete ob objectivity um, but I don't think any, certainly in journalism, I don't think anyone's quite resolved how to do that. Not least because also there is this, right now in this political moment in America, there is this great desire to emphasize truth and like the search for truth. And there is this, there is this conflict between the idea that no, we are all actually individuals with our own foibles and, and, re, and we're all researchers with our own biases and a, a competing um, insistence uh, uh, that, 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 no, that there are facts and we should be able to find them out and, and that's the great thing about reporters in, in, in the modern age and that's like kind of contradiction that, that I don't think we are able to kind of um, uh, reconcile. Great last statement. Patrick, thank you very much. Parul, <laughs> you too, and Tabas, wonderful to have you all here together thank again. You. Thank you, Amir. Thank you so much. You go home and write, and I will make a lecture.